Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today we have a very special surprise from our sponsor, Monster Ivy Publishing. They've given me the honor of reading the first chapter of Trinity Row by Kelly Martin. Monster Ivy's books are edgy but clean from a Christian worldview. Head on over to their website at monsterivy.com and sign up for their monthly giveaway for great prizes. Thank you again to Monster Ivy for special access to Trinity Row. And now, on with our story time. Chapter 1 If it's as dead on the inside as it is on the outside, we're all screwed. My mom and I arrived at the house known as Trinity Row a few minutes ago, and so far, we haven't spoken to each other. We haven't looked at each other. We haven't taken our eyes off the house. A few pieces of ancient cement from what would be a stretch to call a sidewalk crumble under my heels, and I have to stagger back to catch myself on the side of the truck. I always thought our 05 Chevy was old. Looking at this house, clearly, I have the definition of old wrong. Well, mmm, Mama is speechless. Or rather, she has words. But words she'd rather not say in front of me. Trinity Row is a new venture for us. I'm sure she doesn't want to scare me off any more than I already am. Oh, I'm scared, all right. Jane is a liar. This was supposed to be the easy house. One to make us money, so we could move on to bigger and better things. Or, at the very least, move to the next town and try to forget. Moving would be the easy part. Forgetting would never happen. I mean, it's standing. That's about all Trinity Row is. Standing. I'm sure back in its time it stood beautifully. It reminds me of one of those southern gothic houses. The ones with turrets and balconies. And all sorts of unnecessary decorations that made it the envy of all the neighbors. I imagine old women sitting on the large wraparound front porch. Breaking green beans while chatting about the latest gossip in Lawrence. I'm sure... Children played in the bright green grass in the front yard. Everything had been ideal. Everything had been perfect. Until the 20th century happened. I'm sure tragedy struck. People died. Souls were left behind. Bad things happened. The house decayed. The bodies inside decayed. And now we're here to fix it up and sell it. I see nothing that can go wrong here. Especially since it's no longer a grand southern gothic princess. Its heyday disappeared with the horse and buggy. Two towers reached towards the sky. Making the house look taller than the two stories Mama said it was. The second seems to be bulking a bit outward and the first is tilted ever so slightly on its side. All the windows are boarded up except for one on the second floor, where one lone, lace, dingy-looking curtain blows in the fall breeze seeping in from broken glass. Brown grass as tall as my knee fills the patch of land surrounding Trinity Row haphazardly, contained only by a rusted metal fence surrounding the property on three sides. The other side is held together by a falling wooden fence that appears to have been painted white sometime in the Washington era. All the other houses around the neighborhood are brick and look fairly the same. One story, probably built in the mid-70s. Large trees in the yard. Curtains closed in the picture windows. Every other house on this street looks to be alive, 
hiding, but alive. Nothing about Trinity Row is alive. Jane is supposed to meet us here at three, says Mama. We're about ten minutes early. Jane is someone Mama knows, who called out of the blue and asked if she'd like to buy Trinity Row. Mama, in a fit of insanity, said yes, and here we are. To be fair, we've been driving ten hours, Mama. To be fair, she's been driving for ten hours. I've been pretending to be asleep. It helps cover that awkward silence that unfortunately happens on long trips. There's only so much small talk a person can get through before the real important topics of conversation inevitably sneak in. I'm not ready to talk about the real important topics of conversation. Neither is she. So, we have infinite small talk. At least, it gets us through the day. I hope it gets us through this renovation. So, are we really going to live here while we renovate? Because I'm not even sure the floor will hold us up. The porch might collapse before we make it that far. It's no worse than the house in Camden, she counters, giving me the side eye. She totally knows this house is worse than the house in Camden. Though, not by much. Okay, it is, but Jane assured me that it's safe to live in. I thought it was condemned. It is, kinda. But look, this house was a dollar. One dollar. We can renovate it and sell it. We can use that money to buy a house of our own. Wouldn't that be nice? To not have to run. Not have to move so much. My chest tightens. I knew what she stopped herself from saying. She was going to say, to not have to run like we had been. I can't say that I want to stop running. I will say that if she wants to stop, then I will. But only for her. Who knows? Maybe Lawrence, Tennessee is just the place to settle. She gives me an awkward side hug. Neither of us has worked out exactly how we're supposed to act around each other now. At least we're trying. More than I can say for my dad. He left about six months after the incident. He told Mama it was either me or him. She chose me. She chose wrong. Don't go that far. I tease lightly and smile. It feels nice to smile. My cheeks will hurt in the morning. I can't remember the last time I smiled, and the smile not be forced to make Mama feel better. She pats me on the shoulder and grabs her duffel bag from the back seat. Let's see what we got. What we've got is a mess. I can tell her that without going through the motions. This is our third house renovation in three years. I love doing it. The renovating is fun, and knocking down walls is therapeutic. Making something pretty out of something ugly is good for the soul. However, there's renovation, and there's whatever we're doing at Trinity Row. It will most definitely be our biggest job yet. Again, Jane is a liar. I think Mama is up to the challenge, though. It's when she looks the most alive. I grab my bag, too, and follow Mama through the old latch gate, which reminds me of the one we had at the cemetery in Jasper. It's a few miles up the road, where our original road trip started. I never wanted to go back there. Of course, I never wanted to come back to Tennessee either, but here I am, home sweet home. The walkway to the porch crumbles under each step, just like the sidewalk did. Good thing Mama paid only a dollar for this place. I have a feeling it'll take up most of our savings to pay for the renovation. I know she's hoping for a big return. We'll have to make it look less like a haunted attraction for that to happen. Optimism. Mama leads the way, 
surveying the house with every step she takes. I'm sure she already has color scheme ideas flooding her mind. She probably even has an open house date all planned out. Planning is what keeps her sane. I didn't inherit that gene. My brother did. Right when she puts her foot on the first step, a scream bellows so loud, a murder of black birds erupts from their roost behind the house and have a flying tizzy toward the sky. They squawk and flap their wings frantically until all of them have disappeared toward town. Mama grabs my arm and spins me around until I'm behind her on the first step, blocking me from whatever made that noise. She holds me back, her hand on my waist, keeping me from moving, protecting me from whatever is coming our way. The screams turn into words. One word, actually, repeated. No, 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 no. I peek over Mama's shoulder. A man, he must be in his eighties, stumbles and trips on the walkway toward us. His blue, cataract-covered eyes are frantic, scared, terrified, terrifying. His white hair flies around his head. No. No. He points his crooked finger in our direction. It shakes violently. I'm not sure if it's because of us, or if he has a disease that has affected his body and his mind. Sir, sir, calm down. My name is Amber Black. This is my daughter, Ivy. We bought this house. We're supposed to be here. We're going to fix it up. So hopefully, some nice family can move in. Wouldn't that be lovely? Mama's voice is calm, but shaky. She's still holding on to me, her fingers digging into my skin through my coat. Her reassurances only make things worse. No, he yells louder, stumbling over his feet and falling to his knees. It doesn't stop him. Instead of running toward us, he crawls. Sir, Mama stutters, caught between helping him and her primal need to protect me. She shouldn't worry about me so much. A bloody trail forms behind him the closer he gets to us. The sidewalk is scraping his palms, then cutting into the thin skin of his knees. Maybe we should go, I whisper in Mama's ear. Obviously, this man doesn't want us here, for whatever reason. And if he's this determined, then maybe we should listen. I don't want to be somewhere I'm not wanted, and I don't want to be somewhere that doesn't want me. Trinity Row doesn't want me, that's totally fine. I'm not attached to it in the slightest. No, is the only word I can understand. He's mumbling incoherently as he crawls toward us. Mama lets me go and reaches into her pocket. I'm going to call for help, sir. I'm going to get someone to help you. Before she gets the phone to her ear, a young man, he looks to be around my age, runs from the house, falls to his knees, and grabs the old man by the shoulders. Stop, he orders, his voice calm but demanding. The old man's eyes widen, and he shakes, looking the younger man in the eyes. Do you remember me? The young man asks. The old man places his palm slowly on the younger man's face. He cups his arthritis battered fingers around the younger man's cheeks and rubs it gently, lovingly. He nods. Good. The younger man sounds happy. He pats the older man on the shoulder a few times, a silent understanding falling between them. I wonder who they are, and how they know each other. Mainly, I want to know why the older dude wants Mama and me out of Trinity Row. If he knows something I don't, I'm all ears. The younger man clears his throat. Look, you don't belong here, right? You need to leave. No, he grunts, shaking wildly. 
The younger man holds on to the older man. Yes, West. Yes. Listen to me, okay? No. West, I assume his name is West, pushes the younger man back. He doesn't budge. The younger man reaches for the other man's hands. West, stop it. You're going to hurt yourself. Calm down. They're fine. No. West moves to the side. And when the younger man follows him, West ducks to the side and gets away, his eyes frantic, and his movements stiff. The old man crawls toward us again. A guttural yell fills the air. No, West, stop. The younger man staggers in front of the older one. Again, the younger man puts his hands on the older man's shoulders to stop him. West pushes a timer, too but it is obvious that exhaustion is winning. When it seems West has no fight left in him, the young man gently brushes the hair back from the old man's sweaty forehead and pushes it behind his ear. It's okay. I promise. I'll make sure everything is all right. I'll take care of it. You need to trust me, remember? The old man hesitates and whimpers. West, remember. The old man breathes in a few times, deep breaths, and places his age-worn hands on the younger man's hands. He pats them a few times and nods. Good, the younger man says shakily. Good. You need to go home now. Fear fills the old man's eyes, and he points toward Mama and me younger man finally turns toward us, and for the first time, I can actually see who has been trying to protect us, or rather, protect the old man. Sky blue eyes, almost the same color as the old man's, are the first thing I notice. They are piercing, handsome, beautiful. They draw me in, and I have to fight to focus on something else. His hair is a nice distraction, dark brown, slightly curly, and flops in his eyes. He has on dark blue jeans and a white t-shirt that has sleeves that are a bit too tight for his muscles. It's chilly today, and despite that, he doesn't have on a jacket. I'm cold just looking at him. It's okay, West. I'll take care of them. Don't you worry. He turns back toward the other man. Go home, okay? It's good to see you. West gives us a weary look, like there is some sort of battle going on in his mind. He opens his mouth to say something, but closes it just as quickly. Whatever it is, I guess he thinks Mama and I don't need to know. I'm not so sure about that. The dark-haired guy helps West to the gate and whispers something in his ear before pulling him into a quick hug and then sending him on his way. Once West is across the road, the dark-haired man turns on his heels and strides confidently toward us. When he gets a few feet away, he smiles a smile that would make the angels think lustful thoughts. I know I do, even though I shouldn't. Deep dimples cut into his cheeks, making him look completely innocent and completely dangerous all at the same time. My name is John. Welcome to Trinity Row. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. Thank you again to our sponsor, Monster Ivy, for the special treat of reading the first chapter of Trinity Row by Kelly Martin. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.